Good afternoon. I am Sherry Trimble, museum educator at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I just wanted to let you guys know the session is being recorded. Uh, the plan is early next week. We will send out anybody who's registered for the program and social media will send out that recording. We are going to do question and answer today. We're going to use the question and answer featured at the bottom of your screen and we're going to do those questions at the end of the program. I'm also going to put some information in the chat box about the PHMC's etiquette and policies. And now I would like to turn it over to the State Museum Program Director, Bradley Smith. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bradley Smith, Program Director at the State Museum of Pennsylvania, and this is Curator's Choice, a program of our Learn at Lunchtime series. Today, we are pleased to introduce Dr. Kurt Carr, as this week's Curator's Choice speaker. Kurt has been an archeologist with the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission since 1980, and he has been the Senior Archeology span Curator with the State Museum since 2007. His program today is entitled Deadly Contact, Europeans, Native Americans, and Pandemics. Kurt, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Brad, thank you. Thank you and Sherry. Today, I'm here to talk about uh, pandemics and diseases amongst Native American populations. Uh, pandemics have been devastating uh, human populations for many thousand years, probably not more than 10,000 years, but beginning probably 5,000 years ago, we certainly uh, were suffering from uh, mass diseases. Uh, the Black Death the bubonic, or, and the bubonic plague, um, they're well documented in Europe and actually in, in Asia too, and they killed tens of millions. In the New World with Native American populations, we don't have that kind of documentation until the, well, we don't have it until the Europeans have been here for almost 200 years. Um, <clears throat> but we do, we're relatively certain that tens of millions of Native Americans were also dying uh, from diseases. Now, this presentation is just going to be a brief overview. There's been books written on this subject, uh, and it's pretty interesting um, the way the disease is spread, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to uh, spend time talking about the effects on Native populations, and especially considering the fact that this they were being affected by these diseases at the same time that the Europeans were invading their homelands. Um, a pandemic can be defined as a disease that's prevalent over an entire continent, over the entire world. And that's what we're experiencing right now for, with COVID, COVID-19. An epidemic is a more localized event. Uh, and epidemics are actually more frequently, the word epidemic is more frequently applied to Native American populations. I'm going to use those two terms somewhat interchangeably. When it comes to the new world, when it comes to North America and South America, uh, pandemics, widespread continental-wide diseases were introduced when Christopher Columbus showed up in 1492 in the Caribbean, in the West Indians, West Indies. It, we think that the first island that he landed on was Hispaniola. Uh, we know that within a few years, well over a million people had died in the Caribbean from disease um, and also being enslaved by the Spanish. It got to the point though, where the islands were practically empty of Indians of, and uh, the Spanish wanted slaves and actually had to import them from Africa. So it was pretty devastating. Uh, we all have heard stories about Cortez and, and Pizarro uh, conquering the Aztec and the Inca civilizations. Uh, I've often wondered how was that possible in, in terms of or related to Cor uh, Cortez Cortez had an army of 250 people. Um, and even with Indian uh, mercenaries that he hired on, how could he possibly conquer the Aztec, which had tens of thousands of soldiers? Uh, well, there's more to the story. Uh, Cortez uh, heard about the gold in Tenochtitlan, which is the capital of the Aztecs at the time. Uh, he went there with his army. He you know, met Montezuma. Uh, there was some kind of interaction there, uh, and Montezuma was killed, and it's not clear who killed him, um, but he was killed, and actually Cortez had to fight his way out of the capital. He did so. Two years later, he came back with, admittedly, with a 
uh, uh, an army of Indians that he had, who were enemies of the Aztec. But then he, he conquered the Aztec at that time. What you re usually don't hear is that in that intervening period of between 1519 and 1521, uh, yes, probably a million uh, Aztecs died uh, from smallpox and other diseases. And a similar scenario is true uh, for Pizarro, that actually, you know, he was attacking, they were conquering a very weakened government, very weakened empire. Um, diseases were also spread once this, the Spanish settled down. Uh, they were spread in North America. Uh, Coronado uh, went looking for gold in southwestern United States, uh, and several other explorers went through that area. They didn't find anything at all. Um, and in fact, on at least two cases, they barely made it back alive. And there were many, many Spanish that died in that trip. But during that trip, they were spreading disease. In southeastern United States, um, De Soto, Hernando De Soto, he wandered through the southeast. He ran into many large, what we call city states uh, of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, many years, a couple of decades after he went through the area, and you can see it outlined here, um, all those cities practically all those cities had disappeared. The population had been greatly reduced. And we don't know the exact numbers, but definitely they were reduced. Um, in the Northeast, New England, Mid-Atlantic region, it's harder to identify uh, when disease started. Um, well, considering we understand, you know, we, we have some ideas of interactions between Europeans and natives. Uh, they probably began in the 1400s. We know the Europeans were fishing off the, the Atlantic coast, and uh, we know that they were coming ashore to dry fish, and at times they were trading with the Indians. Uh, and we have artifacts that date to the 1450s uh, in New England. So we know that they were here interacting with the Indians. Almost certainly they were spreading disease, spreading germs, if you will, at that very time. We just don't know a whole lot about it, and it hasn't been well documented. Uh, but also the French during the early 1500s were going up the St. Lawrence Basin, St. Lawrence River, and the Spanish were actually in, in about 1575, uh, were in the Chesapeake Bay. So there are several opportunities again uh, for, the, uh, for European germs to make their way into um, native populations. And actually identifying diseases in the archeological record, just to step back for a minute, um, has always been a problem. Um, certainly in the mid-Atlantic region in New England, we don't have a lot of skeletons, so to speak, from, these, from the time, from the past, uh, to examine, to see if they were suffering from a disease before European contact. Uh, one thing we do look at, and this has been an ongoing issue with archeologists, is that there are certain time periods where the number of archeological sites seem to drop significantly. And on the right-hand side of your screen, there are two graphs that um, show the results of the number of sites and projectile points, if you will, uh, from the Maryland area. And the yellow graph here is from Pennsylvania. And you can see uh, between about 1,500 and 2,500 years ago, there's a very precipitous drop in the number of sites. And actually over the past 10 years, people have been a lot more diligent about trying to find those sites. And there are sites there. The, the area has not been vacated. There are still people living here, but it does seem that the populations are much smaller. And for the most, for the most part, um, the archeological sites from this time, site, time period are also smaller. It does seem to suggest some kind of, um, the population moved or was reduced and maybe they moved. It's just that we don't find ev any evidence of that. We just don't find sites here. So maybe that was a, a a pandemic that struck at that time, but it's really difficult to prove, so to speak. Uh, a good friend of mine, colleague Jim Herbstritt, he identifies uh, pandemics, a pandemic or some kind of disease in the lower Susquehanna Valley. Uh, about 1250 AD, the Susquehanna, lower Susquehanna Valley was uh, occupied by a culture that we call Shanks Ferry based on a particular pottery type. It spread out in, uh, it was concentrated in the Conestoga and the Peckway, as I remember, 
Jim's probably listening to me and cringing, but uh, they initially expanded in the lower Susquehanna, but then they gradually retracted. And actually by about 12, 1525, they had retracted to right along the river. And it was during that time that the Susquehannock showed up and the Shanks Ferry seemed to disappear. Uh, and it seems that maybe they were, one explanation is that maybe they were weakened by a disease. Uh, and so it was easy for the, the Susquehannocks to move into that area. When it comes to well, recorded or well-documented pandemics, uh, one of the first that we know in this region, at least, uh, is the Wampanoag uh, tribe in Massachusetts that numbered around 12,000 at the time the European or the Puritans showed up um, in the 1620s. And by 1675, that population was reduced by 90%. So thousands were dying. And we only know the Wampanoags. There were others, more interior tribes that we don't know much about. It is interesting, though, that the Wamp Wampanoags <coughs> dominated the Sarragansetts, and that was a much more that was a more interior tribe either. So that the Sarragansetts didn't have any access to the Puritans, and <coughs> uh, they were practicing social distancing, if you will, at that time, and they didn't suffer the same kinds of diseases and decline, at least at this time. And actually, once the the Wampanoags were in a, a poor state, lower population. Uh, the Narragansetts insisted on taking some of their territory. So that's one of the things that happens as a result of, of these pandemics, these diseases where you suddenly lose a large part of your population. This is a list of different places where, again, we have reports uh, along the Connecticut River of a village that was reduced by uh, 95%. Uh, the Mohawk Valley uh, archaeologists have been uh, studying that area for a long time. Uh, Dean Snow has worked in that area, um, is somewhat of the expert, um, or at least was the expert for that region. And he was uh, identifying, he was interested in population changes and population sizes and density. And he estimates, the, estimates that the mortality rate uh, for the epidemic there in the 1640s uh, was 63%. So thousands and thousands were dying. Uh, overall, the five nations, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, uh, during the 1640s, their population was reduced in half. Again, thousands of people were dying uh, based on uh, because of diseases. Um, the coastal populations were really decimated. We don't have a lot of information on, on them because they seem to fade away very quickly once the Europeans get here. But the estimates, Dean Snow estimates that 90 percent of them were dying from uh, diseases and interactions with the Europeans. Um, the <clears throat> it is interesting again that just people dying isn't the only problem <laughs> with with these epidemics. Uh, the Susquehannocks in the 16 middle of the 1600s uh, they dominated the fur trade in the Susquehanna Valley. Uh, they were controlling the fur trade with the English and their neighbors to the north, the Iroquois, and to the west uh, were upset with this. They wanted direct access to the, the English and their trade goods. And um, so there was warfare, so to speak, going on with the Susquehannocks and these other tribes. In 1661, when the Susquehannocks were hit with smallpox epidemic, that really changed, that really upset the balance of power. Uh, and by 1675, the Susquehannocks were gone. Uh, and it was due to disease, but it was also they were being pressed by the Seneca and the Onondaga. The Lenape, it's a little more nuanced story. The Lenape were in the Delaware Valley uh, and had lived there for, uh, well, <laughs> certainly from the time the Europeans got there. But they had gotten along with the Europeans. They were able to negotiate a relationship with the Europeans based on the trade uh, and also they made it known that they didn't want the Europeans coming here to live. They could set up trading posts, but they didn't want them setting up villages and, and plantations and so on. Uh, and they were able to control that for uh, probably close to 100 years. But eventually, the Lenape population, again, was reduced by these epidemics. And with immigration, well, the Dutch and Swede and Finns were already there, but especially once the English started coming in, uh, soon you know, a Lenape family or a Lenape village hamlet um, may have been, you know, originally surrounded by, you know, five European families. But after a while, they were surrounded by 20 or 30. And the Lenape actually just didn't like that. They were well outnumbered. 
they were losing influence and control, and they voluntarily moved, if you will. Uh, they, they felt they were being forced out by these numbers, but they just moved rather than being forced out and rather than you know going to war, so to speak. It wasn't until later that they got upset and came back. But so you have these different kinds of responses. Um, the <clears throat> native populations, for the most part, um, they had a community response to these pandemics. Um, and so in terms of caring for the sick, it was a community effort. These people who got sick from the pandemics, from the epidemics, uh, from smallpox and the various other diseases that were affecting uh, the populations, uh, they were cared for by groups of people, which is a really nice idea, except when you have such a communicable disease. So that led to, again, more deaths. Uh, one of the responses, though, of native populations, sometimes this worked, is if they couldn't handle the disease, if they realized that, it, you know, uh, if it's catastrophic levels, uh, they would just move. And they moved as a community. Sometimes half would stay and sometimes, but they moved as a community. So you had that kind of solidarity with native population. It wasn't quite as chaotic. Uh, the Europeans, in terms of their, the way they looked at these epidemics, um, there's a quote, and I will be honest with you, I don't know where, it, where this quote comes from, but uh, I think it's reliable. And the quote is, and they saw this, the epidemics as an act of God. And it's where the English come to settle, the divine hand makes way for them by removing or cutting of the Indians, either by wars with one another or by some ravaging mortal disease. So to them, this was a religious, this was supporting the Europeans' right that they could come and take the, the, the natives' land. So again, there's these um, attitudes that are, uh, that the Europeans shared as opposed to Native Americans shared in reacting and responding to these pandemics. And I just wanted people to imagine, I've thought about this a lot, what would happen if 80% of everybody I know died? They weren't there, they were gone. And, you know, I look at, at our holidays at Thanksgiving and Christmas where we all get together. Uh, there'll be 30 or 40 of us. Uh, now, what happened if 80% of them went, that there was only 10 or 20 of us left? And these are just social things. Now, think of our whole society with 80% of them going. Uh, <clears throat> and you would end up with parents that didn't have any children, children without parents, only one spouse survived, your political, your religious leaders, they would be gone, uh, or some of them would be gone. Uh, and now you would have a whole new you know, way of looking at the world with a much, much smaller population, and it would be somewhat chaotic, and it would be scary. One of the questions that is frequently asked um, is, <clears throat> why, do, why were Indian populations so susceptible uh, and the Europeans were not? Well, <clears throat> the usual answer is that the Indians didn't have any expect didn't have any experience with these diseases. They had not developed any immunities to these diseases, and that's a fine answer. And, and to some extent, it's true. Uh, but why didn't they have the, these diseases? The rest of the world did. Asia, Europe, Africa—they all had these kinds of communicable diseases. Why didn't Native Americans? Uh, and Jared Diamond, who uh, is the great symph synthesizer, if you will, of uh, archaeology and history, uh, but he's also simplifies a lot of things. Uh, he looks at the differences between the old world and the new world and said, new world didn't have any domesticated animals. And domesticated animals, as we know with COVID, uh, that's our animals, at least. Uh, that's where some of these diseases come from. And because the new world didn't have domesticated animals to speak of, that's uh, why they were so, these diseases were so death, uh, devastating uh, to Native American populations. Um, in addition, these diseases spread well where you have concentrated populations. As you can see from this image right here, most of Indians over the past 10,000 years lived in very small populations and were moving. It's only in the past 1,500 years where they started to concentrate and live in one place at all. And for the most of that time, again, it was scores or maybe hundreds of people, um, not thousands the way you had in, throughout the Middle East and, and Europe. Um, there is, in terms of uh, 
<clears throat> we, we hear this a lot, but uh, the earliest example of germ warfare in the New World, at least in North America, was uh, uh, two English officers, uh, General Jeffrey Amherst and Colonel Henry Bouquet, who conspired to affect the Delaware with smallpox. Uh, they did this at Fort Pitt. Uh, they got blankets, what I've read, blankets and a handkerchief, and they gave it to two friendly or several friendly Delaware. Why would you give it to your friends? I have no idea. Uh, and the Delaware weren't much of a problem by the 17 by 1763. Their population had already been decimated uh, by 90 percent. They had moved out of the Delaware. They had moved out of Pennsylvania for the most part uh, by that time period. Um, so it seems to have happened. That's a real example. Um, but I don't even know what happened to the people that they gave the blankets to. I don't know if they survived or or they spread the disease, but it's supposedly um, uh, an example that we hear about frequently. I'm giving you a time check now of 1236. Okay, I'm moving right along here. Um, pandemics, epidemics continue throughout into the well into the 1800s. This picture of the Mandan, um, the Mandan were visited by a steamboat. Steamboat had smallpox and their population dropped from 1500 to 31. And then we see that we see smallpox move all over the Great Plains. And uh, all, the, all the major tribes were affected, thousands and thousands died. And it wasn't until the virus ran its course, that's the phrase that's used. And, and I assume that that was the point at which that we reached sort of crowd immunity. There were so many people that had been affected and, li and, li and survived uh, that it just wasn't killing many people after that. Um, epidemics have continued in Pennsylvania, as, you, as we all know, uh, yellow fever, typhoid, Spanish flu, which was the big one in 1919. Uh, and for the most part, we, excuse me, for the most part, we uh, responded in behavioral ways to, to deal with the, with the disease. There were some, I guess, flu shots with the 1919, uh, but now we have flu shots on a regular basis. And certainly that's the way we're dealing with COVID-19. We have vaccinations, if you will. Uh, just some final comments on epidemics. Uh, it, we hear in the news all the time that, you know, marginalized communities, minorities, uh, they are being affected more um, than other populations within our society. That has always been the case. And again, they have lots of documentation on that when it comes to the bubonic plague, especially in, in London. Another uh, aspect that I'd like to mention is that uh, and this is a, an article out of the newest Smithsonian Magazine. There seems to be a whole new generation, or at least a um, um, heightened use of American, uh, Native American healer, healers. Uh, and this is emerging in tribes, especially in the West. Uh, but this is invigorating those tribes, this traditional treatment and traditional response to diseases, along with um, the medical advances that we may have made. This is a good idea. This is a good thing for, for tribes to experience. So I'd like to finish by saying that we are always adapting to our environment. Uh, our environment is our, our culture, our environment is always changing. I think that we've seen though that there are, for a pandemic, epidemic, for these diseases, there are a variety of components. We just can't come up with the vaccination. Uh, we have to treat both the, the social and the political uh, and biological and technological components of these diseases um, to have any real success um, in making it through these diseases. And <clears throat> I think that I can wrap it up there, Sherry, and we can spend some Yeah. Oh. So you uh, want to stop sharing your screen. Oh, one more. Right you must uh, acknowledge people. Yes, I do want to acknowledge, especially my colleagues in the section of archaeology, Janet Johnson, Liz Wagner, Dave Burke, Melanie Mayhew, Kim Sebastian, Callie Holmes, and Jim Herbstritt. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge for their moral support and technical knowledge, uh, Sherry <laughs> Trimble, 
Brad Smith, Brady Seitz really helped me out with the slide. And finally, our director, director of the State Museum, Beth Hagar, Hager, who supports this uh, program and really works hard at it. And I thought this very romantic view of Pocahontas saving John Smith, I mean, that just says love all over the place. So thank you very much. <laughs> That'll be it. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Yep. And, and so we're going to have Kurt and Brad both turn on their videos. And what we're going to be doing, I already see about 10 questions that are coming into that question and answer box at the bottom. And that is what we're going to be using here. Some people put in a few um, suggested places uh, to look up some research. I will confirm those uh, sites with Dr. Carr and I will share them uh, when I send out the recordings just to make sure those are good emails to share with everybody. But from now, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. Go ahead, okay, Brad. thank you, Sherry. And as you mentioned, we have quite a few questions. So we will try and get through as many as time permits. If you're not able to stay with us, Sherry, have you shared your contact information that folks can uh, yes. send questions will, afterward? I'm gonna share that while you guys are chatting. I will put my email uh, into the chat box and you can get that. And of course you get the emails from me. So you guys can always email That's me. That's true. Probably. So if we're not able to get to your question or you're not able to stay with us, but you think of questions now or in a week, please feel free to write to us. So with that said, Kurt, we have many questions. Wow. So I'll just uh, jump right in. First question, could disease have been an explanation for the disappearance of the lost colony of Roanoke? It could. Uh, they are, were European, so they would be somewhat resistant to diseases. Uh, but yeah, that's always a possibility. Um, I don't know a whole lot about uh, that site. I think they've actually started to find remains, but uh, sure, that could be a reason. One of the the questions with that, well, there are many questions, but some years ago, there were these stone tablets uncovered, uh, which offer an explanation as to what happened to them. Um, but I think the veracity of the that whole story has been questioned. They think the tablets might be fraudulent. Um, next question. That's, that's okay. my understanding also, Brad, is that they are fraudulent. <laughs> yeah, I remember that part of it. Uh, what evidence was found of the 1660 smallpox that affected the Susquehannocks? This is uh, written reports. So we just know that it affected the Susquehannocks and that there were lots of Susquehannocks dying. Uh, I, uh, and, and I don't know this uh, material well enough, but to my knowledge, these are almost secondhand accounts. I don't know that anybody was in Susquehannock villages and said, everybody's dying here. So, but they are, um, and I think there are several references to the Susquehannocks being affected by uh, some major disease. For some reason, they think it's smallpox. Okay. Next question. Could you elaborate on the history of the Susquehannocks and the reason why the Dutch referred to them as the Minquas in the Lenape language? Secondly, how did the mini sink interact with Europeans on the Delaware River during the 1600s? Um, the first one I can answer with some confidence. Uh, the Dutch called them Minquas because that's what the Delaware, we probably think that that's what the Delaware called them, calling them. And actually the Susquehannock, that name, uh, is that's not what the Susquehannocks called themselves. We're pretty sure of that. What they called themselves, we're not sure, but uh, they weren't calling themselves Susquehannocks. So most of these tribal, many of these tribal names, uh, and that includes the Delaware and Lenape, Muncie, uh, Mincy, they, those names are actually coming from their neighbors. So when the Europeans arrive, they meet a group and, you know, let's go meet the Mingos. Uh, that's not, that was the Susquehannocks, but that's not what they called themselves. Kurt, am Just I remembering? Just a vague answer, and I, I apologize for that. Kurt, I seem to recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's just probably in Barry Kent or someone like that mentioning that Minkwa actually meant terrible people. It was not a term of endearment. 
<laughs> and often that's, I mean, think about it. Um, if you're going to introduce your friends to somebody that you don't like, you're <laughs> not going to call them the glorious people. You're going to, you know, yes, that is that right. That's another thing that we seem to see. Uh, Barry Kent does have a pretty detailed, though, uh, in his book, he has a pretty detailed uh, discussion of the name of the Susquehannocks and also the Susquehanna River. So that would be a reference to go look at. Next question is a, uh, an interesting one. Recently, LIDAR archaeology has strongly suggested that the Mayan civilization may have numbered in the tens of millions with large cities. These would rival some of the European and Asian cities at the time. How might this change the perspective that G disease would not have moved among indigenous populations prior to contact? And, and that really is a great question. Uh, it is, without historic documents, it's very difficult for us to document these diseases. Uh, everybody says, well, don't you find lots of bodies? No, but we never find lots of bodies. I mean, it's pretty rare. And the bodies that we find, yes, we do find cemeteries, but only for the most recent time periods for the most part. So, um, yeah, that's not the solution to identifying epidemics and mass die-offs or even warfare for that matter. But yes, the Mayan and also in Brazil, we're finding, you know, based on, again, aerial photography, uh, we're finding lots of big cities. And these cities are occupied, uh, you know, they cover some time range, but again, they seem to occupy thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. Uh, yes, they could have got contracted diseases and probably did, um, I, but we just haven't, we don't have the data for that. But they they almost certainly would have. And again, for the most part, this is in Central and South America, where you have these kinds of populations. Um, another interesting aspect of this whole question, you know, uh, the population estimates that we have for North and South America really vary between about 20 million and 80 million Indians at the time of European contact. So there's the 60 million gap we really don't have a good handle on how many people were here. Uh, I tend to be at the higher level, especially considering this information from uh, middle America and also South America in terms of the cities that they had down there. Mm. Well, that's really amazing. Yes, it is. And it's, um, <laughs> but it is a very difficult archeological problem because one of the prime, and I'm really getting off the topic here, but one of the prime movers in cultural change is population density. And if we can't figure out how many people were here at any one time, it's hard to you know, address that issue. Mm -hmm. I digress. Next question. Do oral traditions reveal information about the perspective of the Native Americans related to pandemics? Um, I'm almost certain that it does. And I just have not gotten around to asking that question to Native Americans. I'm sure that they have a perspective that I, you know, I, I need to work harder at, at uh, addressing that issue on all, on all kinds of uh, topics. Next question. Weren't some entire populations wiped out by disease, such as the Calusa in Florida? I would imagine, um, uh, I'm sure many groups just disappeared or many groups, their numbers were reduced so far that they just couldn't function as their own culture anymore uh, and moved in with other groups. Hmm. Do you distinguish between Indians and Native Americans or indigenous people in your research? Well, most of my research involves uh, before the Europeans got here. Um, and I've discussed the word we use or the words that we use to describe those people. Um, they, uh, in a general way, um, Indians or Native Americans seems to be a, appropriate. Um, and I, I think it varies, but uh, Native Americans is sometimes the preferred term around here. Um, whenever you can, it's my understanding that you should use tribal names or even clan names to refer to a group of people. Okay. 
You mentioned the theological interpretation of the English. Do we know if indigenous cultures viewed these epidemics in spiritual or theological terms? I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Um, I'm just not aware of what they were, you know, what their response was. Did they think that they were being punished? Did they think that this was witchcraft? I know Indians in Pennsylvania certainly uh, used with witchcraft. So that could have been uh, part of this. What type of rituals did the Susquehannocks use to try and cure uh, pandemics or smallpox? Is there any evidence of healing practices? Uh, I'm sure there is. Uh, from what I know uh, from the Delaware, um, they uh, smoking, using smoke, smoking different kinds of herbs. Uh, that was certainly part of these ceremonies. Uh, they tried to, uh, another part, another aspect of these ceremonies is they felt that there was something bad in tight inside the individual and that bad thing has to come out. And so they actually had tubes for sucking um, and trying to get that out, but also inhaling these different kinds of smoke. Um, that was, and I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if there were also uh, liquids that they drank uh, to get the badness, if you will, out of them. What do you think about the theory that the mass, mass deaths led to the reforestation of North America and then led to a mini ice age in Europe? Uh, <laughs> I haven't, I'm not familiar with that theory. Um, I try to stay up on these things. Um, I don't know that the mass death deaths of Indians would bring back the forest. Um, along our floodplains, you know, all over the east, uh, yes, Indians had been growing corn and farming those floodplains and living on those floodplains for a thousand years. Uh, and those floodplains might have been relatively open. But the rest of the interior, it's my understanding, was mostly forested when the Europeans got here. Um, it'd be hard to imagine that that was open. So um, how that would lead to the mini ice age, I'm not sure. And wait a second, we talked about the little, we're talking about the little ice age. Little ice age maybe lasted up into the 1700s, but little ice age, yes, was, seems to have been harsher in Europe. Um, I'm not sure about how the forest would Get into that though. Sorry. Is there any evidence of disease spread from the early Viking explorers? No. Uh, but again, identifying diseases is difficult, and they may well have spread diseases. Um, yes, they were certainly affected by diseases. Um, I. Well, yes, I know that they were affected. The Vikings were affected by diseases. And so uh, they could have spread them over here. Um, but as you know, the Indians seem to resist uh, the Vikings. Uh, so they seem to have been relatively healthy to be able to do that. One of the reasons, to my understanding, one of the reasons the Vikings left is because they were having trouble with the Indians. Mm. Just couldn't get along. Does your research reflect any efforts to contain, to contain the pandemic in the areas identified? I'm not sure how they would contain it. Um, yes, we. I don't know if they were, uh, actually, as I tried to explain, I doubt that they were, um, you know, locking up people in houses to keep them from spreading. I don't, that doesn't seem to be part of their plan. The way they cured people, the way they dealt, at least from what I know, is that uh, they, the whole community tried to deal with this disease, with this problem. So they weren't uh, social distancing, quarantining, for example, that didn't seem to be one of their um, responses. Are there any, is there any evidence of disease in skeletal remains? Yes, but it's very difficult. It, take, it requires a uh, relatively detailed and expensive osteological analysis. And so it it's there, um, but 
uh, we don't have a big sample. People aren't systematically looking at all the skeletons uh, to get that information. Okay. Next question, when visiting Plymouth Plantation, I believe they said the pilgrims moved into an empty or abandoned Native American village at Plymouth. Do we know if it was empty or abandoned due to European disease? Um, I actually think that might, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I have a book right here, at arm's length, that would give me that information. But no, but there is some story, yes, that either um, disease had impacted that population already, um, or th there was some other issue going on. But the Puritans, ten years after they landed, they were killing Indians in incredibly large numbers. And that's that uh, image that I showed of the first Thanksgiving is um, <laughs> interesting, very romanticized, let's put it that way. Were the Europeans exposed to any indigenous diseases when they first came to North America? Uh, actually, uh, Christopher Columbus is credited with bringing venereal disease back to Europe. There's some debate as to whether there was a European venereal disease uh, or if it was just North America or just the New World. But he definitely brought back a different strain with him. Other diseases, I don't know. I, I would think that they would have their own set of diseases. Um, they might not have been viruses, but I would think they must have had their own diseases. And the Europeans continued to die of smallpox over here. So they weren't completely immune to it. They just were, you know, there were more Europeans that could resist that, resist dying uh, than Indians. Next, in Western Virginia, we see the cultural flux of the 17th and 18th centuries, clusters of indigenous folks from different cultural groups coming together for short periods of time, and often the mountains. While some have referred to them as refugees from epidemics, might disease have led to the reestablishment of long-term trade and family relationships? And thinking about Kaiser, Potomac Creek trade, intermarriage, and the depopulation of the Shenandoah Valley? That's a great question. And when I was working in the Shenandoah Valley, I probably could have answered it better than I can answer it now. But <laughs> that was a long time ago. Uh, there were certainly refugee populations moving around. Um, whether they were, whether they coalesced in the way this question is suggesting, I, I really can't say. But they were moving, uh, you know, they were devastated. The Susquehannocks were a, a refugee population, if you will, and they joined other Indian groups from the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, but almost certainly, uh, these groups moved, some groups moved west. I mean, the Delaware moved west and joined up with other Indian groups out there. So that was certainly going on. Whether they were following old trade routes, that uh, I'm not sure of. I have a quick question for Sherry. Sherry, how are we doing yes. on time? Yeah, I was just about ready to say I'm going to let's do two more questions and then we'll wrap up anything that's still remaining. Um, I will have Kurt answer those and get back to you as well as any questions you would like uh, him to answer after the fact. Once again, put that in my email. Okay, so we have quite a few more questions than two left. So I'll just try and pick two that uh, uh, are maybe particularly relevant. Here's one that's pretty interesting. William Penn is well known for his interactions with Native Americans. Is there written documentation of him mentioning pandemics among the Lenape? Well, I'm not familiar with that literature, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't know. Um, I've used that response several times today, haven't I? Yeah. But <laughs> these are interesting questions. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. And certainly I wouldn't be surprised that his agents were aware of, of pandemics or disease amongst the Delaware. Again, the Delaware had been living amongst Europeans for a, a relatively long period of time compared to some of these other groups. 
So they had almost certainly suffered some uh, damage from that relationship. Uh, and But they, they did fare well until the English showed up. And then the, the difference with the English as opposed to the, the, the Dutch and the Swedes and the Finns is that the English came to stay. They brought settlers. They came here to live. And they very quickly out, outnumbered the Delaware. Um, we actually have two questions that are very similar. So I'll, for our very final question, I'll sort of combine these. Um, were the Europeans knowingly using disease as germ warfare against the Native Americans? And is there uh, historical evidence you can cite related to the infective uh, smallpox items given at Fort Pitt? Um, people have accused um, Europeans, Americans, if you will, of using germ warfare. The only evidence that I know of is that example at Fort Pitt. And this is very bad, but I don't remember where I got that reference. But I have certainly seen the reference several times. And so I guess I have some confidence that 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 actually happened, that that's true. Um, but do remember that the Europeans suffered from smallpox too. So uh, you have to be pretty careful if you're going to use that kind of, that crude mechanism of distributing uh, disease or you know, trying to decimate your enemy. All right, well, these were excellent questions. And, they were excellent uh, questions, thank you. And we appreciate that. Uh, all of you were engaged and in, in thinking about the topic very much. So I think that concludes yeah. our program for today. And I'll turn it over to Sherry for any uh, closing comments on uh, procedure. Yeah, thank you for a great program. As a reminder, next week, we'll be sending out this recording as well as any of those links that you put in. I'll confirm them with Dr. Carr. Any remaining questions or additional questions, I'll include those with that email. And then, of course, we'll put it out on social media. Uh, Dr. Carr will actually be coming back next week for Learn at Lunchtime. He's going to be joined with our museum director, Beth Hager, and our colleague, Janet Johnson. And they're going to be discussing um, the Fort Hunter Mansion. And uh, we're going to be looking at the excavations that have been taking place there for the last several years. Uh, so that'd be a great one to join. Um, once again, I put a few things in the chat box, some links to donation if you'd like to join us with that, uh, as well as my email. Once again, thank you for attending and everybody have a great weekend.